So good morning, good afternoon, evening. Welcome to this webinar, Decision-Maker-Led Implementation Research for Strengthening Health Systems in Low- and Middle-Income Countries. Uh, I'm Zubin Shroff, Technical Officer at the Alliance for Health Policy and System Research, who will be moderating this webinar. Today, we're also marking the launch of a supplement issue of Health Research Policy and System, which brings together findings from the Delia program, which was conducted by the Alliance for HPSR, uh, UNICEF, uh, with support from Gavi. Uh, so today we're also marking the launch of this supplement issue which is available online. Uh, before we proceed uh, any further, just some house rules. First, could you please uh, mute your microphones uh, in the interest of ensuring that there's clarity of sound for everyone. Uh, for questions and answers, please type these in the Q&A box and not in the chat box. Uh, we'll be having time for question and answer session um, at the end of this. Uh, up just before the closing, we have time for q and and finally, the webinar is recorded and the recording will be available on the Alliance website. Um, so I'll just begin with a brief overview of today's program and for the next hour and few minutes. We'll begin with uh, Ariel Mankuta providing an overview of the Delia program, uh, what the projects were, the selection process, uh, and she gives us a brief uh, bird's eye view of the program as a whole. Uh, this will be followed by reflections from two research teams that were involved in the program from Nigeria and Pakistan. Uh, this work, as I mentioned, has been carried out in partnership with UNICEF and Gabi, and we'd like to hear first from, we'll hear from UNICEF, from Dr. Abu Bakr Campo, uh, the director of the health section at UNICEF, uh, about how this is, uh, and the Delia program is helping from UNICEF's work on the ground. We'll then hear from Hope Johnson, director of monitoring and evaluation and planning at Gabi, about Gabby's perspectives on this. Uh, we'll then go on to uh, my colleague, Marta Coletto, who will discuss the alliance and ongoing engagement with UNICEF and Gabby and how this is building on the program, uh, followed by a question and answer session. And Dr. Abdul Ghaffar, the executive director of the alliance, for this, I will provide closing remarks. Uh, so, with this, uh, I'd like to hand over to Ariel Bampuso uh, for the first presentation. Uh, over to you, Ariel. Great. Hi there. Thank you, Dr. Sharaf. So I'm happy to be with you today and to share a bit about decision maker led implementation research. Next slide. Thank you. Next slide. So decision maker led implementation research on immunizations or DELIR for short is an initiative of the Alliance for Health Policy and Systems Research and UNICEF with funding from Gavi. Its goal was to support research that aims to enable the effective implementation of immunization programs or services. And as such, its purpose was to develop new knowledge or strategies for existing interventions, not to pilot or test new interventions. So far, a total of two calls for research have been issued for eligible countries on priority immunization issues. Next slide. These calls for research had two innovative conditions. First, the principal investigator had to be a decision maker, hence the approach being decision maker led. Second, these decision makers had to work in collaboration with a researcher. Thus, the research team had to include at least one researcher affiliated with an academic or research institution based in the study country. Next slide, please. So who are these decision makers? For the purpose of these calls, decision makers were defined as individuals directly involved in implementation of an immunization program or service. So these include program managers, district health officers, et cetera. Next slide, please. The response to these calls was overwhelming. We received a total of 125 letters of intent. These letters of intent were screened to ensure it met basic criteria. It was implementation research. It was decision maker led. They then went through a process of independent external review and adjudication. In the end, a total of 14 projects in 10 countries were selected, mostly in Africa and Asia. In this map, you can see the eligible countries in dark gray and the selected projects in each country in dark blue, where multiple projects were done within the country White numbers indicate the number of projects. So for example, you can see Nigeria, Ethiopia, and Uganda. Next slide, please. 
There were four key components of the process for these projects. At the beginning of the project, research teams participated in a protocol development workshop. The purpose of these workshops was to identify and refine a research question that responded to the decision makers need. Following the workshop, teams were provided with a protocol template to guide them in the development and planning of their full project. In the template, emphasis was placed on describing the current implementation barrier, the knowledge needed, the plans for use and stakeholder engagement. Ongoing technical support was provided throughout the duration of the projects. At the end of the project, research teams participated in a data analysis and dissemination workshop. The purpose of these workshops was to develop recommendations and products targeted at decision maker audiences. Next slide, please. Here you can see the list of supported, of supported projects organized by their priority immunization issue. The priority immunization issues were vaccination and coverage, demand creation communication strategies, barriers to immunization services in urban slum areas, demand and vaccine hesitancy. Next slide. Health and immunization systems and program management monitoring and evaluation strategies. Can you go back one slide, please? <laughs> Sorry, back one. <laughs> Thank you. So some of these projects have been highlighted in the supplement and we invite you to read these articles to learn more. I'm also excited to say that we'll be hearing from two of our research teams from Nigeria and Pakistan about their experience with the decision maker led approach. And on that note, I'll wrap it up and pass it back to Dr. Sharaf and just to say thank you all for listening and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ariel, for that overview. Uh, so we now move on to the country presentations. And as Ariel mentioned, we have the two of the country teams presenting here today to give us their reflections on their projects and the process of the decision with led approach. So at first, I'd like to invite Ngozi Akwata Kibe from the Royal Tropical Institute uh, in based in Holland. Uh, and she'll be discussing a project on the use of parts of the action research to address immunization challenges in urban state in Nigeria. Uh, over to you and Apologies. Good afternoon. <laughs> oh, good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, so we for, for Nigeria, we carried out a participatory evaluation and action research in Ogun State. Um, it was a collaboration between the state primary healthcare development agency and Royal Tropical Institute. And um, we had the researchers that were in country as well, um, Dr. Lufemi, um, and Dr. Adana. Adana was a Fulbright scholar at the time, attached to the University of Nigeria, and then Dr. Obola in the University of Ibado. Then Dr. Mayoline Dileman and myself of, um, provided the technical support quality assurance from the Royal Tropical Institute. And Dr. Elijah Ogunshola was the decision maker, the principal investigator in this collaboration. Next slide, please. Um, the background, um, Ogun State in Nigeria implemented the Reach Af uh, Every World Strategy in Immunization in 2006. Um, and by 2015, they had full coverage in 12 out of 20 local government areas in the country, uh, in the state. Um, but there were pockets of unimmunized children uh, in eight LGAs. And with the highest in Remo North, they have 35%. The DHIS in Remo North um, local government area shows 37% of the children. Please, you can click. There's another thing coming. Yeah, thank you. 37% of the children were unimmunized. And exact barriers responsible for this trend um, were not known since they were really 12, the 12 LGAs 
and the eight LGAs were in the same context and the same real strategy had been implemented. But we thought that a possible underlying cause would be weak community links to immunization. Next slide, please. In terms of process, we saw the call by the Alliance for a decision maker led implementation research. And we reached out to our network um, in search of a progressive government stakeholder in Nigeria we could collaborate with. Um, we were told that Dr. Gunshola, somebody recommended Dr. Gunshola to us. Uh, we wanted, in terms of progressive, we meant somebody that um, would be willing to do research and somebody that was really keen on transformative change. And uh, Dr. Gunshola was um, recommended, and we asked him to send us a half page document on any problem he would like to solve in the country. And he um, highlighted this problem that there were pockets of unimmunized children in L its LGAs. And um, he also told us there were supply and demand side factors, but the exact barriers were not known. So we um, formed a research consortium, um, which of course was led by the policymaker um, to conduct a participatory action research on immunization from 2016 to 17. We chose two focal words in Romo North, which had the highest burden of unimmunized children. And um, Ilara had 26% coverage, Ibarra 76. We just wanted to understand um, what the differences would be implementing in both sites, but um, Ilara wanted to know how to really increase that coverage. Um, the PAR aimed through iterative processes of reflection and action between communities, health workers, and local government officials, facilitated by researchers, to identify um, the contextual problems and also proffer, um, so you can click again, please, there's one more thing there. Yeah, to identify the relevant problems and facilitate um, the implementation of local solutions to the contextual um, barriers identified. Please go, thank you. Uh, just a, a, a small illustration of how the collaboration worked. Um, the government agency, that's the implementing agency, the state primary health care development agency can be seen on the right side. And then this, the real strategy was still the intervention is still basically the same things, but packaged differently using the, the mechanism of intervention delivery, the implementation research, the PAR, which consisted of policymakers, community members, health workers, local government, and then quantitative and qualitative researchers. But in terms of what was actually done, the actions, the dialogues and actions was the community members, the health workers, and the local governments that um, collaborated to um, do the dialogues and um, develop the action plans after we had presented the situational analysis as evidence that they could dialogue about. And then Pete provided the technical support. We were also some sort of participant observer, monitor with systems perspective, and using the reflexive monitoring and action approach where we had regular monitoring visits and re reflexive cycles, interactions with the group, the PAR, um, the participants to find out how is it going in terms of during the implementation period and allowing them to reflect together and uh, um, come up with issues and address issues as well. Next slide. Um, just to show a little bit of the outcome of this study in a Lara world, which we started, by the time we started with, um, it had a baseline of 26%. Um, two th 2016, um, we implemented, we did the, first of all, we did the situational analysis identified the factors um, that had come out from the communities and from the um, implementers and every, what was really going on. And then we presented in a validation workshop to the communities, local governments and health workers. And they had the dialogues and developed joint action plans and implemented. So after the first action phase of about four months, um, we saw that the, um, the the coverage rose in Elara to 59%. By the end of the P 
PAR in 2017, it had just continued that upward trend. But what we found very interesting, because we kept tracking through some WHO validated surveys uh, um, and quality assurance surveys and the DHIS, we saw that Ilara, he kept going. They kept having meetings. They kept having um, working with the health workers. The communities were very much engaged. So that capacity we built within that one year in the participatory approach just kept things going in Ilara. And Ilara had full coverage for a couple of years until the COVID um, pandemic. Okay, so this is gone. Next slide, please. So our key learnings, um, joint planning, implementing and evaluating health interventions by community members, health providers and local governments can improve routine immunization. Yeah. And collection of evidence, that, as we did in the situational analysis, and integration of evidence into discussions and dialogues with, with stakeholders can lead to change. Please go ahead. No, yeah. Embedding the PAR into the national program of on immunization, not, not you know, using it as a separate um, intervention, but it was part of the MPI, and also integrating the dialogues and actions into an action into existing social mobilization structures, the World Development Committee, the SMCs, that really enhanced effectiveness. And jointly making health services work drives change, not only among community members where we saw social pressure for change and also increased social accountability for health workers, we saw that. And of course the context matters. We had um, a progressive policy maker to work with. We had engaged government, both at the state and local government levels. Leadership is critical success. And also involvement of the traditional rulers within Ilara and Ibarra was very important to success. Yeah, next. And the concluding reflections, we were actually wondering um, at, at the time, is this, is this a sustainable model? And of course, we've, we've had evidence to show that it can be, is decision maker led embedded in the program, uh, immunization program? evidence of commitment between the three groups and uh, the community members really showing responsibility for action and action-oriented behavior and um, no financial incentives were offered for participation beyond transport reimbursements and uh, we, we saw that we, we needed a longer time of implementation and even though we with research of course to understand how this approach interacts with the context um, in view of transferability, even though we've not had that longer time of implementation, but we've seen this um, spontaneously continue on its own. And then uh, final reflection would be that the key thing is that it's important to reinforce, strengthen and use existing potentials and resources within the context, because those are the things that really drive change even when you leave. Um, Thank you very much. You can go to the next slide just to appreciate the Alliance, UNICEF, and Gavi for all the support and allowing this to take place. Thank you very much. We received a lot of support. Thank you. Thank you, Ngozi, for that very interesting presentation Please. and showing the real impact of this work uh, on the immunization rate and also the need for reinforcement and these power cycles. Of course, you keep having action cycles that frame as part of the participatory action research approach. So we uh, thank you again. Uh, we now would like to move on to Pakistan. The Yasin Shafi will present on the Delhi project in Pakistan, which sought to address uh, barriers to immunization in the urban slums of Karachi. Uh, over to you, Yasin. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Yasin. Thank you. Um, uh, Delighting to give me this opportunity to present. Uh, I'm uh, I'm based in Karachi, Pakistan. I'm senior manager at one of the CSO here, uh, Vital Pakistan Trust. Uh, I'm also a member of Gavi CSO Training Committee, and I'm also um, a, a member of uh, Global Vaccination Demand Hub. So I'll be I'll be sharing with you uh, key insights and key learning from uh, the project which we have uh, implemented back in 2016 in uh, some of the urban slum of one of the largest metropolitan city of Karachi. And uh, we we try to engage with the with the local government over there, district government and uh, e uh, provincial EPI, and to 
and to explore uh, with them uh, what are the key barriers, both supply and demand side uh, related to immunization, uh, particular in uh, in the context of urban slums. And we uh, we really uh, uh, one of the key objective of this project was to uh, was to explore uh, what are uh, how, what are the key ways to uh, actually address those barrier from the viewpoint of yeah, all the EPI stakeholder, just not the leadership, but people who are actually working on ground. Uh, people who are uh, who are doing day-to-day -day, uh, immunization uh, activity and implementing vaccination program at the at the field level. Um, so uh, so uh, to to uh, accomplish those uh, top three um, objective, uh, we assess uh, the immunization coverage uh, in the uh, in those targeted slum and come up with the uh, immunization coverage in different pockets and try to uh, identify uh, uh, zero dose children defaulters. Uh, fully immunized children and in the next phase we reach out to those uh, zero dose defaulter and fully immunized uh, household children with the ha uh, household to actually um, uh, get the insights on uh, demand related barriers um, why uh, why particular household is against um, a particular antigen uh, for example, polio, um, why uh, XYZ children is defaulted. So this, the idea was to give uh, the program people the real insight of what uh, actually happening at the ground level. And we know from our experience uh, that these are the people who actually engage in so much uh, implementation of the program, day-to-day -day activities, micro planning, but really don't have a good uh, sense of uh, 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 good sense of sense and insights of those uh, barriers which they are facing both in terms of supply side as well as demand side. So the project outcome uh, was to inform decision makers, policy maker, EPI manager and district management on key implementation uh, research related barriers at community level. And there were some uh, our uh, output of the uh, of the, uh, that product, uh, uh, this research as well, which I'm going to share with you in a while. So particular to demand side barriers, uh, we identify uh, five main uh, thematic areas. One is related to, uh, and all these are actually, uh, has an implication on the poor immunization coverage, uh, poor accessibility, uh, zero dose and defaulted children. And those, uh, uh, these are the specific reason which actually uh, uh, leading to uh, disease hospital hot spots and uh, overall uh, uh, decrease in immunization coverage. So um, the key problems which we identify through this research uh, from both um, program perspective as well as community perspective was uh, their household related barrier where a woman is not allowed to go outside. Uh, there is uh, poor decision making at the household level and lack of prioritization to the uh, uh, to the immunization uh, per se. Uh, gender we identify as a key uh, issue which we uh, uh, which we try to highlight it at the at the program level as well. And we are really glad that, um, uh, especially in the context of SIN, uh, now government is uh, focusing on hiring more and more female vaccinators. Uh, the gender sensitive services, uh, when we say it's basically uh, male dominant vaccinators, uh, more than 90% of the uh, vaccinators, uh, especially in, in SIN province, uh, as well as in some other other provinces are all male um, people people actually inform us uh, share their experience uh, that uh, they are insensitive they are not providing good uh, counseling their behavior is not professional um, related to vaccine hesitancy uh, we learned that uh, there are religious uh, misconception uh, there are myths uh, prevalent in the community and uh, a lot of people have uh, a fear of side, effect, uh, side effects, especially in case of pentavalent. There are you can uh, you can see in the data that uh, there are significant drop from pentavalent to penta two and then uh, to penta three. Um, and then uh, social and religious barrier where informal uh, healer have their uh, key role uh, in um, keeping people aside from the vaccination, influencing their decisions. And there are also hardcore refusals in particular ethnic groups. For example, uh, Pashtun community in uh, across uh, in different pockets in urban slum of Pakistan, uh, especially in Karachi, uh, though, who are hardcore refusals for uh, polio vaccine. Uh, 
So this is what we um, gather uh, the insight from the community and also from uh, heard from uh, from the EPI managers and the uh, field implementer what kind of uh, barriers they uh, they are facing uh, in terms of uh, demand relationship. Next slide, please. So. Um, Major gain uh, from this project, um, we uh, um, uh, we were able to um, 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 actually um, uh, uh, engage all the all the key stakeholders, starting from uh, policymakers, uh, leader at the field, and district management, uh, all aiming uh, to address the issue of zero dose and poor immunization coverage. So uh, there are four uh, different um, areas which we uh, actually able to work through this project. Uh, first, uh, understanding the vulnerable community. We really um, try to uh, generate data with the help of uh, EPI leadership and the program people uh, to identify uh, what are the key challenges in these vulnerable communities. Uh, further, uh, we we also uh, th th gave the better understanding uh, of partner roles in overall immunization ecosystem uh, for better uh, synergy and to fill gaps in both supply and demand side. Um, we also were able to uh, connect vulnerable these vulnerable community with the health system um, because we know that there are different partners who are working within the same community. How to use uh, their strengths. Uh, and uh, uh, to to convert it into um, uh, better uh, program related outcomes and uh, address the missed opportunities and improve overall access to the health services, especially uh, immunization services uh, and using uh, integrated approaches. Then uh, we also, um, as a product of this um, project, we were able to uh, develop a framework uh, uh, which, which was developed in consultation with the policymaker and key stakeholders uh, to mitigate uh, supply side and demand side, which I'll be presenting on the next slide. Uh, then finally, um, uh, yeah, there was- Yeah, just to interrupt, you have five minutes. Sorry? You have five more minutes. Yeah, sure. So um, demand related, uh, uh, demand, there were also based on this project, we created uh, a portfolio of demand generation activities for, um, for the uh, for uh, for uh, overall Pakistan, especially for the context of urban sum. Next slide, please. So this is uh, the framework uh, which we uh, developed based on our research finding. It has uh, six major domains, uh, uh, starting from uh, mandatory staff training, uh, which uh, uh, program people really highlighted that this is really important. Uh, adequate allocation of funding standardization and integration of digital tools, uh, especially uh, to register uh, all the births in the community and to track children and uh, for vaccination tracking, as well as zero dose user digital platform for accurate setting and achievement of immunization target, especially for micro planning, uh, mutual sharing of resources between different programs, for example, EPI, LSWs, polio program, and structure uh, human resource department, which they highlighted is key important. Next slide. Then uh, this is something which we uh, which we recently developed with the uh, on the request of um, uh, EPI program uh, based on the findings which we shared with them. Uh, they shared an appetite that uh, we all uh, partners are working in silos, uh, especially they're not aware what CSOs are doing in terms of demand uh, demand generation activities. We uh, they really uh, based on the findings uh, they demanded uh, the uh, principal investigator that we should create we should consult all the organization working on demand generation to create this portfolio. I'm sorry for the short uh, font size of this uh, framework, but happy to share with you whoever want to uh, look at this. So this is overall uh, 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 activities which Pakistan uh, in Pakistan, which uh, all the partners in Pakistan are leading in terms of demand generation in last 10 years. Uh, it include both EPI program, w UN agencies, uh, CSOs, academia. So 47 uh, in different intervention were identified and we were able to map uh, in this framework. Uh, next slide, please. So what, what are the challenges we faced uh, when we implemented this project? 
So being a CSO partner and implementer of the program uh, and uh, partner with the EPI both in terms of fixed uh, 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 immunization services as well as demand creation, um, the act of sharing uh, challenges and hurdle with the policy maker it's, itself is a challenge. Uh, they initially um, uh, say very uh, uh, a clear no to you and then gradually they try to understand that they are, this, uh, this is happening at the field side. And then understanding those uh, findings were uh, and giving them an idea this is what's happening, it was a real challenge. So uh, we found that uh, ownership of the finding at higher uh, as well as district level was uh, was a key issue. But with the with the gradual push and slow push, we were able to uh, actually uh, made them realize that this is what uh, field realities are. Then rapid change of roles. We talk uh, with one person at the leadership role uh, one uh, one month, and very next month uh, another person uh, uh, joined in and. Uh, uh, took over the role of the previous leadership. So that's really uh, um, a real problem uh, to uh, start from the scratch again. And then uh, sharing of granular knowledge that what is happening uh, at the field site um, that was and and getting information from uh, the program people was uh, was real a real challenge which we faced. But uh, through continuous talk, uh, we were able to um, get the better insight of those barriers and we were able to um, present it to the broader audience. So uh, I'm stopping here. Um, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity uh, to share the finding and to share the insights. Thank you. Thank you, Yasser, for that uh, excellent uh, comprehensive presentation on Pakistan. Uh, so just two things before we move on to the next presentation. First, that um, please do type your questions in the Q&A chat box. We'll have time for questions and answers at the end. Um, and the other is there is, of course, to be, as I said at the beginning, we are launching a supplement to show health research policy systems, and uh, the link will be provided in the chat chat box. Um, and the supplement issue brings together learnings not only from Nigeria and Pakistan, but also from other countries supporting this work, along with uh, two editorials and a cross-cutting paper about the decision-maker-led approach, which has a lot of insights and learning about this. So uh, I'd like to now, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, this has been a joint effort between UNICEF and Gavi and the Alliance. So I'd like to invite Dr. Abu Bakar Campo, the Director of the Health Section uh, at UNICEF, to provide his perspective on this and the added value of the project. Over to you, Dr. Abu Bakar. Thank you. Thank you, Zubin. And, uh... Dear colleagues, uh, friends, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here uh, with all of you at this launch of the special issue of health research policy and system, showcasing the work of the decision-maker-led implementation research, or in short, DELEA initiative. DELEA is just one example of the strong collaboration UNICEF has enjoyed with the alliances for health policy and system research over the past several of years. At UNICEF, supporting countries to have strong health systems and evidence-based programs is a key focus on what we do. And embedding implementation research studies into programs is one of several approaches we use to do this. We define implementation research as the integrations of research within existing programs implementation and policy making to improve outcomes and overcome implementation bottlenecks. Since 2015, UNICEF has collaborated with global development partners, governments, and local researchers to conduct embedded implementation research studies in more than 25 high burden countries. These studies have focused on a variety of programs, including immunization, prevention of mother to child transmission of HIV, birth registration, nutrition, and newborn and child health services including in emergency settings. We have found that embedding research in programs helps to generate evidence regarding which implementation strategy will improve program effectiveness and results in better outcomes for women and children, accounting for local context and complexities. With the meaningful engagement and leadership of decision makers and implementers within the research team, the approach also improves the likelihood that the research findings and recommendations are relevant to programs and are integrated into policies and programs. In recent follow-up survey 
of the country research teams we have worked with over the past five years, we found that 67% of projects contributed to policy or programmatic change, and in 50% of cases contributed to documented improved health outcomes. As part of UNICEF health system strengthening approach, we use implementation research to shift the way evidence is generated and used within countries to inform policy and decision making. We seek to enhance ownership of research among local implementers to prioritize research on questions of local relevance and to generate feasible recommendations in real time. The topics of implementation research can support implementers to better understand the questions they have regarding acceptabilities, appropriateness, and feasibility of alternate delivery strategies to identify the reasons for poor program performance or to better understand issues of programs cost, coverage, and sustainability. The focus of the research can cover a number of health system challenges. For example, related to data and information systems, human resources, supply chain, demand for services, community engagement, and integrations, among others. We appreciate the excellent partnership we have enjoyed with the alliances, government, and research partners on the delay initiatives. And we are very pleased to see that the experience of those projects are being highlighted and disseminated in the special issue of the journal. We know that the research reflects the priorities of implementers and decision makers themselves, that the findings are the direct relevance to programs in each of the participating countries, and that these efforts are leading to improved health system responses to the needs of women and children. Please allow me finally to thank again the alliances, Gavi, governments, and research partners to have brought us where we are now, and we hope that this will continue in the future. Thank you very much for participating, and thank you so much uh, for your attention. Back to you, Zunin. Thank you, Dr. Abu Bakr, for those uh, words. And with that, I'd like to now invite Bob Johnson, uh, Director of Monitoring, Evaluation, and Planning from Gavi, to give her perspectives and uh, investing in the decision maker led approach. Over to you, Hope. Great, thank you for the opportunity to participate in the webinar today uh, in, the, in the sharing of this important uh, work of the Delir Initiative. Next slide, please. Um, learning um, across uh, several different areas uh, within the vaccine. During our last strategic period, we committed to invest in research. And that was really to optimize program effectiveness as part of strategic investments in coverage and equity um, data, primarily focused on informing Gavi programming on the ground. To be able to address problems of stagnating coverage and ongoing equity uh, inequities, we recognize that this would require an evidence-based approach to supporting the tailoring of interventions to address local barriers to, to coverage and equity. Next slide, please. To support this, um, we engaged with uh, both uh, UNICEF and, and WHO, the, the Alliance, since 2015 to support local projects across more than 10 countries to better understand the issues that program managers were facing and to generate the evidence they felt that they needed to better optimize their immunization programs through the DELIR initiative. And this work supported evidence generation for more than 30 projects, as well as local capacity building for conducting implementation research. Next slide. Through this, we, we had some important lessons. And, and for us, it was is really uh, important to reflect on this uh, as it was our, our first um, venture really more deeply into implementation research. Um, and, and there were some really important um, successes through this. We saw that the upstream practices improved, which included institutional capacity to identify the key evidence gaps and questions, and then to be able to design and implement methods to address these questions, hence closing the gap between researchers and implementers. 
as you heard today, uh, there were policy and programmatic decisions that were guided by this evidence generated that were really, um, uh, you know, geared towards the local context and, and the local issues that they had. And then as a, a byproduct, um, this also provided global good resources that can be accessed and used across countries, such as through this journal supplement. We know that although the local context can, can vary, um, sometimes it's really good to hear about how others have learned um, um, to be able to address some of the issues that they're facing. Through these experiences though, we still see gaps in local institutional capacity to be able to independently conduct implementation research. And this practice has not yet become part of routine practice within vertical programs like immunization. Um, and as such, there are likely to, to be procedural challenges which can cause delays in being able to get that information that decision makers need and in, in a timely manner. Next slide. Looking forward, we now at, at Gavi are part, embarking on a new strategy, what we call Gavi 5.0 for years 2021 to 2025. And, and what's a, totally clear to us is that this will require good evidence and learning to enable the amb ambitious agenda. Implementation research will be critical from local to country as well as global levels to be able to, to support implementation of this strategy. Partnership with partners like the Alliance um, um, and WHO and UNICEF, um, we're already engaging with them to help develop ways to institutionalize implementation research capacities at country level. And further embedding implementation research within immunization programs will significantly help to improve the impact of recommendations. Next slide. In Gavi 5.0, we have the, an, this ambitious agenda to leave no one behind with immunization by reaching the missed children and communities with immunization, bringing them into the health system and ensuring that they receive a full schedule of vaccines as a platform that can also bring other PHC services to these often missed communities, which face multiple deprivations and stand to benefit the most. Next slide. To be able to do this, we've adopted what we call the IRMA framework um, to help us to more systematically address equity across countries. First, to identify and understand who and why children or communities are missed, to advocate for prioritization of these communities with tailored strategies to address their local supply and demand side barriers, to be able to sustainably reach them with immunization and other PHC services, to monitor and measure the outcomes, to be able to learn and further strengthen the approach as an iterative process. As you can see, the role of implementation research will be critical throughout the IRMA framework to be able to identify, implement, learn, and adapt to reach zero dose children and missed communities. We look forward to building on the achievements of the DELIR initiative to further um, this to achieve our ambitious equity agenda as part of GAVI 5.0. Um, so thank you all. I think there was a lot of important evidence generated already. Um, we will use this to help inform uh, the, the next steps, um, but, but definitely more to come and look forward to hearing more of your questions and um, to think a bit more about how we can further embed this within immunization um, and scale this um, across both local and country contexts. Thank you. Thank you, Hope, for uh, that presentation. Very interesting is to see this framework with which Gabby is now operating towards embedding technology into its programs and activities. So now I'd like to uh, go to my colleague, Marta Filetto, who will discuss um, the Alliance engagement with Gabby and UNICEF building on the DB project. Uh, Marta, over to you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, participate in the webinar today and uh, share some of the work that the Alliance HPSR is currently conducting. Um, embedded research is an approach that the Alliance has pioneered uh, with applications in over um, 40 LMICs and one that remains central to our efforts and shapes the design and practice of several key initiatives that we are uh, driving. Uh, let's move to the next slide, please. 
This is a snapshot view of countries currently engaging in embedded uh, implementation research initiatives that we are supporting in collaboration with UNICEF and with support from Gavi. All these efforts uh, put strong um, focus on accelerating impact on immunization coverage and equity. These initiatives have um, larger scale in Ethiopia and Nigeria, as you can see from the number of projects that are being supported in these two countries. These two are also countries where we have been partnering with local research institutions to provide um, technical and mentoring support to research teams in countries, but with the broader vision, um, that of incrementally helping implementation research take hold at the country level and play an integral part in country programs. Next. Our experience in Ethiopia can well exemplify this and uh, is also a good example of how we have built on the DELIR initiative with joint efforts and commitment from the Alliance and UNICEF and Gavi support. Next. Um, now let's stay with the first flash, please. DELIR provided the opportunity to build implementation research capacity of individual researchers on one hand and create a focus to promote collaborations between decision makers and researchers on the other. And we did that, as it was well illustrated earlier, through awarding grants to country-based researchers on a competitive basis and making implementer researcher collaboration in the research process and eligibility requirement. And some of the important outcomes have already been touched upon by other speakers. Next. Following the year, another alliance UNICEF joint initiative supported by Gavi aimed to create a structure to, create, to promote the embedded approach to research more systematically. And we did that through establishing a technical support center in Ethiopia, um, a space to mentor and manage implementation research projects at the country level. Uh, for this um, role, we awarded on a competitive basis um, the research institution of a former DELIR grantee, which is also a testament to the leadership that DELIR um, has helped to build. And at the same time, an opportunity for us to continue and expand the reach of this partnership. This institutional engagement has produced two important outcomes. On one hand, it has helped implementation of research become a core part of master and PhD curriculums, which is providing a sustainable way to build a cohort of skilled implementation researchers in the country. And on the other, it has helped the Technical Support Center to establish as a hub for implementation of research in Ethiopia and, strength, and strengthen their linkages with the government and become a recipient of government funding to drive forward the embedded approach to um, solving implementation challenges. And these are important steps towards sustainability and greater self-reliance. Next. Over time and through sustained engagement, these synergies have brought implementation research to the fore and been built into regular planning cycle and uh, ways of working within government. The two critical lessons from this experience. One is that local institutions need sustained support to continuously sharpen their capacities. And two, the linkages between local research institutions and government need to be nurtured. Uh, this ultimately is a success story of how incremental efforts and investment over longer term are necessary to achieve our sustainable gains. I conclude here, but if you'd like to read the full story, please visit the Alliance website. The link is on the slide and we'll also share in the chat box. Um, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Marta, for that presentation. We now go on to the question answer session and we've already got quite a few questions. Please keep sending them in and I'll, I'll then be moderating them through that. Uh, posing the questions for the different panelists. Uh, so we've got a fair number of questions in already. So let me take the first question. The first question to Yasser, uh, the question that often comes in function with uh, decision makers uh, in doing research with decision makers. So the question from Eva Bazant, I hope you're getting your pronunciation when incorrectly. Thank you for the talk on uh, the work in Pakistan. If there is rapid change of people filling local leader positions, 
How did the project address this and transfer knowledge rapidly and encourage ownership of the project with newly arrived leaders? So over to you, Yasser, for this question. Yeah, so, uh, so yeah, this is this is a real real world challenge. In in most of the developing world, we all know that there are frequent transfer, there are uh, challenges uh, um, at the top leadership, uh, changing their role, uh, giving them new assignments. So it's it's happening very frequently, um, um, and 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 this is something which we try to highlight uh, this through uh, through our uh, finding as well. This is what we are still trying at trying to advocate through our different uh, platform like our CSO consortium platform uh, to the to the EPI leadership and to also to the um, uh, to the health ministries that this is something uh, which really uh, need to think uh, about and to work uh, out so that we should be able to have a sustainable um, uh, team leadership within the program so that uh, we have this um, concrete ownership. Uh, yes, with, with changing role, uh, with changing leadership, uh, this has often happened that uh, people, uh, the new uh, newcomer uh, at least uh, took three, uh, at least took two to three months to understand the realities of the pro program uh, uh, to to actually uh, grip uh, the gear and the handle of this uh, program to run the uh, uh, run the vehicle. Uh, mm, uh, so, uh, uh, so so hopefully in next um, next few years, uh, in Pakistan, including other other developing countries, will be able to address this challenge. I'm not aware uh, what is happening in other countries, but um, I'm I'm pretty sure that this is quite a uh, similar challenge in other developing world as well. Thank you, Yasir. Yeah, Yasir, for that answer. <clears throat> uh, there's a question from Bahadur Yazdizadi uh, asking, "What's the meaning of lead uh, in the decision maker led implementation research? Does it mean active participatory research?" Uh, I'd like to bring in Ariel here to address this question as someone associated with this project from the inception to completion. Ariel, over to you. Sure, thank you, Zubin. Um, you know, this is really a great question. And I just want to say, you know, for the purpose purposes of the call, what we meant by decision maker led was that the decision maker had to be, um, sorry, the principal investigator had to be a decision maker directly involved in implementation of an immunization program or service and had to be working in collaboration with a researcher counterpart. And that was the structure, you know, that we set up, um, you know, from the beginning of the calls. And, you know, this was really in recognition of the value and the importance of engaging with decision makers, particularly in, in implementation research, um, as these are the people who ultimately understand what's going on on the ground, who, you know, have are responsible for leading, um, you know, implementation and making decisions that, you know, would be informed by, by some of this work and this evidence. Um, in terms of, you know, whether, you know, is it active participation in a lot of ways, what we were trying to achieve was meaningful engagement of these decision makers and where, you know, we found that we were really able to engage with them um, was around, you know, in the beginning of the projects, the conceptualization of um, the particular projects themselves, and in ensuring that the research was responsive to what the decision makers need for research was. Uh, we also found that in terms of, um, you know, acting on the findings, making decisions informed by findings, the decision makers were really critical to that process of, of using the research and bringing about changes that were based upon the findings. Um, you know, they also had, the decision makers also had a role in terms of engaging with other decision makers and getting the participation of other stakeholders who might be critical to that process. Um, so really they were, they were essential to the projects, they were critical to the projects, and that was something that was designed from the beginning in terms of giving them this, um, you know, prominence as a pr principal investigator within the projects. So thank you. Thank you, Ariel, for that. Uh, we have another question, uh, which I'll address to Ngozi. 
Um, in decision maker led implementation research, what are the characteristics of a successful PI role and what are the characteristics of the academic partner which is in a key support role? As someone who engaged in this, um, it would be great if you could give your reflection on what you think in terms of project success. Thank you. Um, I think Ariel has already um, um, explained some of it, but one of the things about the successful PI is, first of all, if you have to choose a principal investigator that is a um, decision maker, you have to make sure the person is positionally well placed within the program, that there is some um, thrust to his power, so he's able to really make um, decisions. And uh, because you're going to be working with the local government, you're going to be working with communities and with health workers, you need somebody who has the kind of status that will be able to, that, that will provide, if you're not providing financial incentives, for instance, you do need to be able to provide some more intrinsic incentives, something like, uh, something that motivates them. And when you put something, somebody of a certain prominence in charge of the project, you will find out that he will drive the rest and everybody will be motivated to work hard on the project, to be fully involved because um, they understand that this is somebody that can really make a change. I think that's so, first of all, that leadership role that the PI has to play, you, um, um, the decision maker has to be properly positioned to do that. And just to make sure um, I may be clear, it means don't choose a decision maker that sits on a, you know, that doesn't really, the work he does is not, he doesn't play core implementation role, doesn't really interact with the health workers or with the local government officials, but plays very high management role. When he's out of touch, he may not be able to help you um, well. And then he also has to be able to have the leverage to advocate, um, to give some prominence to the implementation research at a higher level, being able to be part of um, maybe some the core policymakers within the country where they have um, regular um, interactions and discuss things at a high level within states to see what this what, what's going on. So this, the, the decision maker we, uh, we had also was an executive secretary of the board of the primary healthcare um, development agency. And that really helped us to get the project to a national, um, to give the project some national visibility as well. So those are things you really look for when we, that's, kind of person who would help to drive it, both um, bottom up and top down as well. Um, and those, of course, an, another group of people that are very critical are the local government implementers, the people at that level that actually um, are in charge. Those are key change agents within the project, well, because they know how to interact with the communities and to get things done. As um, In terms of the academic um, researchers, um, what we, our role there was we developed the methodology, we developed this, the study design, we did that and we, pro, and we coached the core team, the policymaker, the academic researchers in country were coached by um, Kit in the participatory action research approach. And then we kind of give the technical support through the process. Then the academic researchers, um, the academic people, um, researchers in country, um, they, they worked a lot on the actual study, um, data collection, data analysis, also training people that collected. They were, everybody was really involved in the process. Um, so, and then in terms of the financial, I saw something about who to take the money. Of course, if you want the decision maker to lead, you've got to give the money to the decision maker. So, um, Kate had about 25%. That call was very clear. The Northern institution would have 25%. The most, the bulk of the money would go to the government the implementers, and that was seventy five percent. So that actually meant that they were really the ones doing the work. They were actually the ones um, implementing the research. I'm not sure if I've answered all the questions. So, yeah. 
No, thank you. And thank you, Ngozi, for that very comprehensive answer. Uh, we have another question this time. I'd uh, like to bring, have Alyssa respond to that. Is someone again involved in the project right from the start and uh, working across that in paper? So the question here is often researchers compete and share with MOH and stakeholders with limited uptake of recommendations. Uh, what are the challenges or success, uh, success or lessons learned during the year that has enabled uptake of research recommendations? Uh, so this is about the uh, overall uptake of research recommendations in the DV project uh, and engagement with any and other stakeholders. Thank you so much for the question. And it really is a pleasure to be here with everyone and to see our partners from the countries again after, after a long time. So I think, um, Zubin, I couldn't hear you well, but I think you're referring to this question. Often research is completed and shared um, with limited uptake. Is that the one? Yeah, so it's about the limited uptake question. Yeah, thanks so much. Yes, yeah, so it's true. I think that is the key challenge that we've seen with research. And that's why this embedded um, approach really turns that on its head, where engaging with the people who actually can do the uptake are involved from the very start. And I, I was thinking, even when Ariel started her presentation talking about, you know, um, or maybe it was in Ghosty, sorry. Um, talking about you know, the first thing is to ask, what, what is the implementation challenge that the implementer has and sees as a priority? So starting from that, as opposed to some sort of research question that might be coming from the outside, um, makes a huge difference. And we, um, we at UNICEF, uh, my colleague Shahab, who's online, has led some um, work to really follow up and to try to understand what has been the uptake. Um, and we were really pleasantly surprised that um, that in most cases there, there was integration of the research recommendations into programs and policies. And then we've even, um, as Abu mentioned, we've even seen um, documentation of the actual change in outcomes uh, related to the work. So it's exciting. I think it's the way research should be done. You know, we hear from researchers, they get frustrated that, um, that their findings aren't taken up. Um, and of course we hear from implementers, they get frustrated um, with traditional research that these are not priorities for them. So this whole approach, I think, is hopefully the way that we will continue to do things moving forward in global health, um, because it, it just makes sense and it really does um, lead to important um, changes in uptake. Um, so, and just quickly to say challenges, I mean, I think we do see challenges. Yasir mentioned some of these things, problems with turnover of who's involved. I mean, th these are these are real world challenges. Um, sometimes maybe not, I think as Ngozi was just referring to, not involving the right level of, of, of decision maker in the project. We've learned a lot over the past few years about the approach and, and hopefully um, sharing different experiences like this uh, journal supplement is doing um, and disseminating the challenges and lessons learned, I think, is, is hopefully a way to avoid some of those pitfalls moving forward. But um, I think from UNICEF's perspective, we do feel like this is the way to really um, involve and integrate research into what we're, what we're doing. I hope that, hope that answers you. Thanks. Over. Thank you, Alyssa, for that, uh, for the very clear response. Uh, I have a question to now to uh, Yasser, in fact, first, uh, and then thank you much to Ngozi as well as the country researchers that are with us. Uh, so around the support that was provided, so Ariel mentioned the kind of support that was provided uh, in the form of workshops, ongoing technical support for the protocol workshop and an ongoing technical dissemination workshop. So my question is, two questions. How do you think this enables the policymaker researcher teams to work together? How does it facilitate or not? And what additional support and how do you think this approach can be improved going ahead? So Yasser, first we can hear from you and then Ngozi, just a minute or two each. Uh, so sorry, uh, uh, Zubin, can you, can you uh, repeat your uh, question again? Because there was some interruption, so I wasn't able to hear you well. So my question is around the kind of support that is provided through the Believe project to the country teams uh, from the protocol workshop to the data analysis and dissemination and ongoing support that is provided. Uh, what role do you think, could, uh, if you just want to get your reflections on the role that played in enabling the policymaker researcher teams to work together and also how you think this model can be improved and strengthened? Yeah, thank you. 
so I guess support, uh, which is provided by uh, the overall Delay team, was really, um, really great. Uh, they they pushed us to really think deeply into uh, uh, for for this uh, for this very project, and we were able to come up with a, a really a crisp and uh, concrete objective. Um, particularly for um, uh, to get insights from the policymakers. And one of the key things which we learned from this particular uh, engagement, uh, especially uh, 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 the team um, at, the, uh, at the Geneva, that um, how, to, how to get better insights from, um, from the policymaker, what they want to uh, actually uh, learn from the field. Uh, which they probably, um, uh, there is some missing information which we can gather from, for them and to uh, present it to them. Uh, giving you just an example that when we were collecting this data um, uh, for on demand related barriers, uh, one of the district uh, health officer actually requested us to approach one of the spiritual leader in one of uh, a slum uh, to actually interview him and identify uh, for them why he this particular person is uh, restricting people, uh, his followers, to get uh, their children vaccinated. So this kind of things, uh, which we really uh, learned from overall uh, uh, um, the, the team, that how to get better insight uh, if this is really an implementation research embedded um, and, and uh, to involve program people. So how to uh, get better insight on, on the key barriers. Um, related to your next question, I guess uh, the best way is to, um, um, uh, um, to, to involve more frontline uh, district level people uh, in, in the actual, uh, actual protocol development process um, uh, if, if they are missing. Uh, to uh, to build their uh, capacity uh, to collect data um, to analyze data that's really something which uh, which we really need to work on uh, we all need support and these are the people at the government level who probably need uh, more support um, uh, in, in all those uh, key areas thank you yasir for that uh, and gozi if you could give a brief response about a minute or two uh, Coming close to the end of the program. Yeah, yes, has already. Thank you. Yes, has already said a lot. So I would just say that the protocol workshop, one of the key things it was really good to do um, that uh, the theory of change, being able to get, especially the policymakers and the other people that do, um, that may not have had very strong research backgrounds, to be able to fine tune the theory of change at that level and to have clarity about what was actually what we are actually going to do and what the assumptions were, um, that was really very useful um, at that level. And of course, um, in terms of data analysis, dissemination, those type of workshops were very useful. Um, throughout the process, the DELA support, the support from the Alliance and UNICEF um, really built capacity in the poly, um, with the policymakers in research, and then also build the capacity of researchers in being able to develop, look at things a bit differently and looking at um, other audiences that were not academic or even research-based, being able to develop knowledge products that would appeal to other audiences. That was one core um, capacity built among researchers as well um, from all those workshops. So I think um, that was really good. And also the, the fact that it created a, a place for networks to be formed. And some of those networks have outlasted the Delhi. And those are very important professional networks to actually have. Uh, I think maybe um, it would be nice if the Alliance would leverage on that um, maybe to, if you're looking at what you could do differently. But it was quite a good experience, yes. Thank you very much for those suggestions as well and how the Alliance could leverage on this and build on it. So we're out of time for the question and answer session. Uh, could we have the, we'd like to now hand over to Dr. Abdul Ghaffar for the closing comments. Thank you, Zubin. And uh, I think I'm very happy with the outcome and with the interventions, presentations, questions, and answers. I have three points to make. 
the first is obviously i want to say thank you to everybody all the country teams especially to yasser and negozi for making time today to present what has happened in reality i also want to say thank you to colleagues at unicef my friend abu bakr alisa shahab but also the former leadership from mickey to stefan to komanan everybody has been working with us however the most important pillar of all this collaboration has been gavi where peter hansen and hope from very day one has been able to make a case to their leadership that this is the area we would need to have and make an investment so thank you abu bakar and colleagues and thank you hope to you and all your current and former membership and we greatly appreciate your leadership and collaboration with us obviously i want to greatly thank you to my own team uh, ariel martra zuben and other colleagues who has been helping in this whole endeavor over the years the second thing i would like to state is that we are in for long haul i'm very as i said happy with the outcome the work we have done but some of you might know hope definitely knows it because she has been with us from the very beginning that we started these discussions in fact in 2012 when we were in beijing for the health system research symposium and we thought how can we make sure whatever the research we do it is implementation research systems research operation research or whatever the titles are how can it become more relevant useful and helpful to the program managers and the implementers to implement their programs and manage their programs and to have the better performance of the health systems and that is where we said let's invest into the capacities and become closer to the decision makers and i can tell you we were nervous when we presented the idea to our scientific and technical advisory committee they were like little bit shocked and they said no the pa has to be a researcher and we don't know who will apply or not apply and as ariel said there were more than the number we are expecting number of exp expression of interest so the point i'm trying to make it we are very happy but it is still the work has not been done and both abu bakar and hope highlighted that there is a limited capacity still to generate policy relevant knowledge of the implementation research especially in the lmic and we have to remember when we say like we shifted from the pi a typical researcher to a decision maker it is a power game so it's a politics and public health is all about politics and we have to keep on investing in changing mindsets both of researchers as well as policy and the decision makers but also development agency partners and the funders that how can we make our investment which are more efficient but not only the cost efficiency issues but i think hope use the word which is more equitable but also more relevant to the needs and the headaches and the pains of the policy and the decision maker at the same time i think we have done very well in doing some sort of like implementation or intervention at a relatively smaller scale and those things have been proven effective however we need to scale all these intervention which we take a lot of pride and we need to have some mechanism for real time learning and that is a new area the innovation where we need to invest all of us that how can we do these things where we can have the better and on real time learning but at the same time are we 
generating some knowledge where we can scale our proven effective intervention and that we have to do. And the last point which I want to make is like any other effort, we are all investing, we are all innovating, but we, we are together for a long haul and we need to keep on and believe in each other's strength, each other's wisdom, each other's experience and each other's sincerity that we have a cause which is a common cause, which is a cause to help the people, politician, program managers and the decision makers in the LMIC. So very proud of this partnership and thank you for all your hard work, either in designing, conceptualizing, implementing or disseminating. We remain more than ever grateful to each member of this partnership and we are looking forward to further cement our collaboration and learn from each other. Thank you everybody and Zubin, back to you. Thank you, Dr. Gafar, for those closing comments. Um, and with that, we're at the end of this webinar. Thank you to all the participants. Thank you to all panelists for taking time out for this and to all the participants for registering and being with us right to the end. Um, as Jeff mentioned, I mentioned a couple of times, the supplement link is available in the chat box. And we hope that you enjoy reading the supplement about uh, the new uh, program and the approach that we're using. So thank you very much and goodbye. Bye-bye.